I'm Andy Orm of O'Reilly Media, and I'm talking with Vandad Nahavandipur, who is the author of the iOS 6 cookbook. This book came out fairly recently. It's a follow-on to his iOS 5 and his iOS 4 versions. So welcome, Vandad. Hi, Andy. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I noticed when working on the book that one of the biggest changes in iOS 6 was not a particular feature. It was memory management. And I'm wondering whether this memory management is really there to um, make things easier for developers, or does it just move complexity around? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I've, I've, I've thought about this a bit before. Um, it's definitely made it easier for developers. Um, it has made it even better for end users. I think Apple, like always, they're concerned about the experience that the end user is going to get uh, from the from the tools that Apple gives to developers, you can easily tell that they're um, behind a bit. They're kind of, uh, they don't have the most developer tools out, out there yet, if you want to compare them to other bigger uh, competitors. Um, but they're certainly moving towards uh, better tools. But at the moment, and mo definitely since, since the iPhone was released, you can tell then that Apple was mainly focused on the experience that end users are going to get. So to make that experience better, sometimes Apple gives better tools to developers, and sometimes they go through an overhaul of the whole system or the whole um, tool chain uh, just to make the experience for the end user better. So this, this particular issue with memory management was one of the things that a lot of users were complaining about, saying that when I download an iPhone application, I paid for it, but when I open it, it's crashing. Now, um, you don't want to see that happening a lot as a user because you paid for something and it's work properly. So um, you, can, you, you could easily tell uh, whether a crash in an application was a memory-related crash or was it just some, some other sort of uh, issue. And I, I, I can honestly say that from, from the different types of code that I've seen over the years, and one of the most common issues in iOS development is that developers don't really understand how memory management is working. And um, they have some sort of idea, but uh, it's, it's very difficult to really understand how, how the whole system works together. And as a result, sometimes developers write, write a piece of code that after, after I don't know, maybe 10, 20 minutes of usage, the, the app's going to crash simply because there's some sort of a memory leak. So I think Apple thought about this, and they listened to developers, and they listened to end users, and um, uh, they created a system by which developers don't really have to worry about memory management as such. And at the same time, uh, the experience for users becomes much better because developers aren't releasing the system resources anymore. It's the compiler helping them do that. So when developers don't have to do the memory management, it means that the compiler is going to do it. And the compiler, well, it is quite intelligent. It's become easier for developers, much better experience for uh, the end users. But as, as a result, I personally think it's creating a bit more laziness um, that developers are no longer really caring about how memory management works. And um, uh, certainly for now, at least for the next few months, I'm thinking, I'm predicting that for the next few months, if, you, if, if developers want to get a job as an iOS developer, they, they need to know about memory management and how it really works. Because um, automatic reference counting, which is this feature that you were talking about, isn't really available for older iOS versions. So if you want to create an application and you want to support the uh, for example, the iOS 3, iOS 4, and devices that are running those operating systems, automatic reference counting doesn't work on those. So you have to know manual memory management. And uh, from what I've seen, developers who just recently started moving towards uh, iOS and iOS programming, they've completely forgotten about that part of memory management, and they're leaving it to the compiler. So it's creating a bit of laziness here, but I, I can really appreciate that it's making it much easier for developers and much better experience for the end user. So it's so let's talk very about some of the interesting uh, features that were added. And I think near the top of the list would be PassKit. Yeah, Passwork. Yeah, definitely. And I, uh, it's one of those features that I'm not really sure. Uh, um, I have I have mixed feelings about Passbook. Uh, it's 
I mean, a lot of people say that that's Apple's take on NFC, um, which is near field communication. I'm not, I'm not certain if that's what Apple was trying to trying to achieve here. Um, I mean, I I personally have a Samsung Galaxy S3 here, and it's it's got NFC, um, or supposedly it's got NFC, and I use different devices right here, but um, NFC hasn't really matured yet it's a mess i can say it's a mess like for example to just create an nfc solution that allows users to go make uh, payments for example just using their phone you have to integrate with so many libraries and you have to speak with so many gateways and apis and and they're not backwards compatible so it's it's a bit of a mess because so many players in the game you see but I think Apple is kind of slowly trying to understand that and trying to find out how they can make it better for customers. Because as a customer, as a customer, what do I want to do with NFC? The technology is an important to me. I don't, I don't care if it's got the best chipset in there. I don't care if it's got the fastest chipset in there. I just want my life to be a bit easier. You see. My impression with NFC right. is that the. Uh... A customer just wants to walk into a department store or something, a place that they have no prior relationship with, and use their phone. And so I suppose there are many different APIs because there are so many different vendors and banks, and that might be why there's this proliferation you were talking about. I think, yes, I mean, that's correct. Um, the impression that I have is that obviously banks uh, want to stay in control, and banks want to know what transaction you're making, uh, where you're making these transactions. Did you withdraw money from our ATM or did you withdraw money from some other ATM? Why did you do that? Um, and a lot of companies now that want to that wanna bring NFC to the end user, and they're, they're seeing this as a bit of an issue. They're saying that everything has to go through the bank. And as you know, banks... Um, I don't know how it is in the States, but here in the UK, we have banks that have systems that are about 40, 45 years old. Um, so they don't want to move. They don't want to move with technology. Obviously, they're trying to do something. However, the whole system's quite old. And I don't blame them. I mean, it's a, it's a proven way for them to work. So why would you change that? I think companies need to understand that banks are going to be there regardless, unless the Googles of the world and Apples of the world become a bank. Mm -hmm. So once Apple becomes its own bank, and because I think they can actually easily become a bank because they've got so many credit card information right now um, registered and so many users that they could easily become a bank. But is that is that an area that Apple wants to tap? Um, with Passbook, I think Apple is seeing little bits and pieces of um, how customers want to interact with different systems like payment systems or uh, how I want to, as a, as a railway customer, how, how they can make it easier for me to buy my tickets or show my tickets. But here we're talking about so many, so many changes that are required in all these different and sometimes very old uh, architectures. These technologies will not succeed without the help of so many different partners because Apple isn't a railway uh, network. If they were, they would be able to control the gateways, you know, but they need the partnership from so many different companies. And I think that is why NFC isn't moving as fast as people think it should because yeah, so many players are involved. But Passbook does make things a little easier because it picks off one tiny part of the NFC a sort of area. It's about getting your ticket. It's about having a pre-existing relationship, like Starbucks giving you a coupon. Absolutely. It's. Um, I think it's el enabling the technology is uh, one piece of the puzzle, but being able to use it is the other. So like you said, if Starbucks added integration with Passbook, but didn't really accept that digitally created passes when you go to the store that's quite useless right so what is the point of doing that um but apple i, th I think passbook is making things like for example buying tickets and showing tickets railway whether it's airline it's making it a bit easier but I i'm really interested in seeing how how this is going to evolve at the moment 
is not that mature, uh, as you can expect, but we'll see. We'll see where it's going to go after this.